we're going to be talking about ancient Greece. Um, we're mostly going to be covering the archaic period and uh, the first part of the classical period today. So as a brief introduction, the ancient Greeks, who referred to themselves as the Hellenes, established city-states in various locations around the coastal Mediterranean. They're very similar to a lot of the other civilizations that we've studied in the ancient Mediterranean, where we're starting off with these small city-states, these smaller settlements that are accumulating land and power over time, oftentimes obtaining alliances with one another or fighting with one another, etc. So these city-states were largely independent um, initially and sometimes even competed with and rivaled one another, but were all united in a common language and religion. So um, it is well known that there were many trade routes that existed between the Greeks as well as other occupants of the ancient Mediterranean. So they definitely had um, contact with the ancient Egyptians um, down here, with the ancient Persians, as well as the Syrians. So the ancient Greeks actually openly acknowledged that they borrowed motifs, ideas, skills, and conventions from their Mediterranean neighbors. And especially when you look at the work from the archaic period, you can very clearly see these influences from these places manifesting in ancient Greek artwork. It's not really until the classical period that we're starting to see ancient Greece manifesting its own kind of separate artistic identity. So in terms of ancient Greek culture and society, um, we have Athens, which was considered the artistic and intellectual center of Greece. So this is basically the place where all of the architects, the artists, um, the intellectual elites, the philosophers worked. Um, oftentimes they would guide these massive workshops. Um, Athens was also considered the birthplace of democracy which is this relatively new thing at this time where you're having decisions being made by people rather than like a king or a god. Um, basically, um, members of democracy, like the, the ideal person in ancient Greece was a, a free man. So it was a collection of these free men that were making decisions um, about life and society. So another kind of aspect of this society was this notion of perfection and harmony and idealization. Oftentimes you'll see mathematical formulas and ratios that are used to determine things that are perfect and just. So the ideal Greek human was both physically and intellectually disciplined and male. Women weren't really considered people. Um, and oftentimes you had people like Sappho that would just kind of go to their own island and then write about girls all day. Relatable. So women were usually excluded from the rest of society. They were only permitted to participate in public events like weddings and funerals, and they were typically expected to take care of children and household tasks um, every other time. So typically when we see women in ancient Greek art, they're a little bit more reserved in their stances um, and their depictions, unless you're seeing a depiction of a goddess. In that case, like it's totally fine for Athena to be doing stuff, but you typically don't see mortal women um, in very active poses in ancient Greece. Um, slaves were also very common in ancient Greece, so slaves in this case were people that were essentially from conquered lands. Um, ancient Greek culture was also, um, mani also manifested as this pantheon of gods and goddesses. So the gods in ancient Greece were very human. They were flawed and imperfect. Um, and and yet, despite this, oftentimes when we see depictions of gods and demigods, they, they have these very godly, perfect attributes to them. So just to give you a super bare bones timeline of ancient Greece, um, unfortunately, we don't really get to talk about the time before the archaic period. There's all these fabulous island civilizations that are happening um, that are creating amazing art. And of course, we don't get to talk about them, which is sad. Uh, but around 900 BCE, we're starting to see these more unified city-states forming. So ancient Greek art, as we study it in the AP curriculum, is typically divided into three periods that vary in style and artistic choices. So it's not like the ancient Greeks were 
formally saying, like, we are now in the archaic period, we are now in the classical period. These periods were determined by art historians much later, um, and these these divisions between the periods were uh, marked by significant historical events. In the case of the archaic period to the classical period, the the catalyzing event was the destruction of Athens in 480 BCE when the Persians retaliated against um, the invasion of Persia. Um, the event that is dividing the classical and the Hellenistic period um, is the death of Alexander the Great. So it's during the classical period that we're seeing ancient Greece reach its cultural zenith. That's the point when it has the the most occupied land, um, when you're seeing the highest amount of wealth, um, and during the Hellenistic period, you're seeing this increasing anxiety and increasing weariness in the art. And it's at this point that ancient Greece is eventually absorbed by the Romans. So these two pieces on the right here are um, representing a very common theme in ancient Greek art, and that is warfare. Um, so warfare is a very common theme in um, ancient Greek literature as well. You've probably read or been exposed to the Iliad and the Odyssey by Homer. In this image up here, um, we see a, a, a Greek attacking a Persian. So typically Persians are represented as having these striped leggings and arm covers. Fun fact. So the first period we're going to talk about is the Archaic period. So as the name suggests, this is one of the older periods of ancient Greece. Most of what um, survives in terms of sculpture was used as grave markers and monuments. So up until this point, there was very little life-size figural sculpture produced in ancient Greece. It's really starting at this point in time that we're starting to see life-sized and larger-than-life sculptures. So the vast majority of the sculptures that have been found from this period were marble, um, but gold, bronze, terracotta, limestone, and iron were also used. Oftentimes statues that were made of metals um, are no longer with us because they were melted down and made into weapons or, or stolen and melted down, especially in the case of things like gold. Terracotta is also quite fragile, so um, naturally it, it wouldn't survive as long typically. Um, in order to create metal sculptures, artists are using something called the lost wax process. This typically involves creating a, a wax copy of a sculpture and then placing it in investment, which is usually like a kind of cement, melting out the wax and then filling in the cavity that is left behind with molten metal. So there's a YouTube video down here if you want to see that process in action. So the lost wax process is still used today, albeit in a slightly different way than it was used by the ancients. So um, sculptures were usually painted to highlight certain features, especially faces and hair. Of course, over the course of thousands of years, that paint has since worn away, but there are still traces left. You can see some traces of the, of the red paint left in the sculpture's hair here. So during the archaic period, we're seeing mostly front-facing figures. Sometimes they're in this pharaoh pose in mid-stride. Um, I brought up um, Menkaure and Crean right here from the Egypt unit to, to show you the similarities between these figures in terms of their stance and poses. Um, but there's a lot of differences as well. For one thing, this statue was cut free of the stone matrix. There's a lot more negative space that's being shown here. You can see negative space between the arms and the legs, um, and you're not seeing a, a base that is supporting the legs. So um, one of the things that is allowing this to happen is that the ancient Greeks are developing iron tools, which makes the carving of harder stone like marble a lot easier than it was in the past. We also see this peculiar feature that is referred to as the archaic smile. Um, I've always thought of this as kind of like an ancient depiction of the Lenny face. We have this slight upward curve of the lips and these kinds of like mischievous looking eyes. So this was oftentimes included to make the statue seem more lifelike and human. So they're, they're, oftentimes you're not seeing this, this disattachment um, and kind of unearthiness that you're seeing in ancient Egyptian statuary. So there's a real attempt here to make these figures seem more mortal and human.
Some of these statues had metal accessories like harps, spears, um, and other kinds of weapons. Oftentimes these items would help to um, inform like who the statue was of. So if the figure was carrying a bow, for example, and was a statue of a woman, then we might have assumed that it was the goddess Artemis. Of course, again, a lot of these were made of metal and they've since been lost. In terms of architecture, um, basically all architecture from the archaic period did not survive. Um, so most of what we know about architecture from this period was from ancient texts. So uh, most of these texts indicate that early architecture consisted of temples devoted to Greek gods, and these temples in particular were made of ephemeral, basically not long-lasting materials, like terracotta, um, tufa, which is a sort of volcanic stone that's kind of crumbly, uh, mud brick, wood, and thatch. So these materials don't last that long, especially in a Mediterranean climate that tends to get very hot. So over time, these buildings have disintegrated. So permanent materials like stone became far more common a lot later, typically like during the classical period when we started seeing these rivalries between the city-states. So at this point, the city-states are kind of to, trying to one up each other. They enter these friendly and sometimes not so friendly competitions. And one of the ways that they kind of show off their material wealth is by using expensive materials like marble to create their temples and statuary. Um, the, order of um, architecture that we see during the archaic period most frequently is the Doric order. So these involve very simple column capitals and um, baseless columns. Um, as we progress throughout the timeline of ancient Greece, you'll see that the um, these columns will become more complex and more involved. In terms of um, other elements of architecture, we're still um, seeing post and lintel architecture Again, posts being these things that are holding the lintel up. So there's a lot of fancy terms that are used in ancient Greek architecture to refer to very specific elements. I'm not going to ask you to memorize those because there are so many of them. You can just get a sense of how many there are by looking at the, the numbers on this. But one, two that you should remember are freeze. F-R-I-E-Z-E, -E, and architrave. So an architrave is basically like an unadorned lintel, and a frieze typically has some sort of imagery on it in shallow relief. So our first AP artwork from ancient Greece is the Athenian Agora. So the Athenian Agora nowadays is basically just ruins. Um, the Agora as well as the Acropolis, which we'll study in the next lecture, were destroyed by the Persians um, in around 480 BCE. So the Acropolis is um, familiar to most people. You can see a reconstruction of the Acropolis right here. Um, the Acropolis and that associated complex is on a raised hill and on the base of the hill is this Athenian Agora. So an Agora is a public outdoor plaza that is used for commercial, civic, social, and religious functions. So initially, this Agora served as a more commercial area. There were lots of shops and vendors. And then over time, as we're starting to see these, these aspects of democratic government coming in, we are seeing um, these government buildings and sacred spots like temples being built in the Agora. So um, one of the most important things that happened in the Athenian Agora was the Panathenaic Festival. So Athena was the patron goddess of Athens. Athena is the goddess of wisdom. You can probably see a similarity between Athena and Athens in terms of nomenclature. So typically cities would have patron gods or goddesses similarly to what we saw in ancient Mesopotamia. So um, there was this structure called the Panathenaic Way, which was basically the, the strip that was used for this annual procession um, of activities devoted to the goddess Athena. So there were many, many temples within the Athenian Agora. Again, I'm not going to ask you to memorize every single one, but this diagram kind of gives you a sense of like how many there are. Um, there is also this... Um, strange structure called a bulutarian, um, which is this chamber that is used by a council of citizens. So this is really our indicator of democracy here. There is a, a council um, 
of around 500 people. Um, these are Athenian citizens that are um, members of government. There is also a tholos, which is a circular sort of temple, which is a place where senators typically held emergency meetings. A structure that we'll also see over and over again in ancient Greek architecture is the stoa. So a stoa is basically a covered walkway. You have columns on either side and it is usually covered. So you're kind of creating this, this long shaded pathway. So these are some examples of these structures I just mentioned. Um, again, the Athenian Agora like no longer exists. It's basically just foundations and rubble now. These are examples of these kinds of architecture from other ancient Greek sites, and these are obviously reconstructions right here. So Atholos is basically a round temple. A stoa is again this elongated walkway, and a bulletarian is this sort of amphitheater style meeting area. So here is a, um, a drawing reconstruction of the Athenian Agora. As you can see, there's a lot of open space um, as well as greenery. Um, so you can really get a sense that this was meant to be an area where people are gathering and getting things done. You do not need to memorize all of these little scattered elements. I've highlighted the ones that are the most important for you to remember. Our next work is the Anavisos Koros. So Koros is a word in Greek that means youth. So a youth is basically like a young man. Um, so Koros is typically a designation used by archaeologists to determine sculptures of male youths made during the Archaic period. Um, they're very canonized in their appearance. They oftentimes have this very rigid frontal pose. They're staring straight ahead. Oftentimes the hands are at the sides or in a very simple gesture. They're very conservative in terms of um, not having too much negative space, at least in comparison to the sculptures that we're seeing later in ancient Greek history. Um, this particular koros was intended to mark a grave site um, of a fallen warrior, um, and that was the most common use for koros statues, um, but some were also made as offerings to gods or they were intended to represent the gods themselves in temples. So what you see here is a, a general uh, and not super personal representation of an ideal warrior rather than a strict portrait of the person that is buried. So we have this very muscular, lean, and fit figure. We're seeing a lot of similarities here with ancient um, Egypt in terms of like these idealized proportions and um, musculature. So... Um, we're also, as I mentioned previously, seeing this, this pose that's very reminiscent of ancient Egyptian figure of sculpture, um, but a couple of notable differences. For one, the figure is nude. Um, this is pretty common in ancient Greek statuary of men um, throughout all of ancient Greek history. Um, the statue is also cut completely from the stone matrix. Again, we're seeing this very um, kind of trademark element of the archaic smile, this Lenny face. Early Greek statuary um, typically has um, shows figures with longer hair as well. So we're seeing these this long knotted hair cascading down the back. This might be an influence from Mesopotamian sculpture. We're not entirely sure. There's also traces of paint left on the sculpture, most notably in the hair. So the counterpart to the koros is the kore. So kore is a designation used for sculptures of female youths or maidens that were made during the archaic period. So you're seeing a lot of similarities here um, in terms of the depiction of the figure between the kore and the koros, where we have this archaic smile and this relatively rigid frontal pose that is not using a ton of negative space. Um, a couple of differences though. For one thing, the Kore is clothed. She has this peplos shawl. That's how, how she received her name. Um, and additionally, she doesn't really have a, a walking pose. Her, her legs are right next to each other. She's standing. Um, it is very likely that um, she had an arm here that was projecting forward and probably holding something that may be um, indicated that she was a goddess of some sort. We're not entirely sure. So she's clothed and she's in a less active stance than we're seeing in the Anavisos Koros. And this is really illustrating the, the societal roles of men and women in ancient Greece. Um, 
So her face, um, it has these um, naturalistic, more rounded features. She has this, this kind of curled smirk that gives her a humanness. And of course, you are seeing remnants of paint in the sculpture, most notably the red. Right here is a reconstruction of what the statue may have looked like when it was originally displayed. Um, and you can see that there are metal ornaments that um, have since been lost. You can see um, holes in the statue where these metal ornaments might have originally rested. So all in all, very similar to the Anavisos Koros in terms of the stylization, um, but still a couple of key differences in the treatments of the figures. I bring up this work, um, even though it's from ancient Etruria, because it is um, quite similar to the work that we're seeing in um, ancient Greece during the Archaic period. Um, I'm not going to be talking about it at length in this lecture, but I just wanted to indicate that there were people that were close to ancient Greece that were immediately influenced by that work and creating artwork that was very similar in style um, to the stuff that we're seeing in Archaic Greece. So we'll be talking about about the Etruscans later. We are now moving on to the classical period. So it's at this point that we're really starting to see ancient Greece come into its own in terms of its own artistic exp expression and identity. We're seeing a deviation from these rigid frontal poses that were very likely borrowed from ancient Mesopotamia and Greece. And we're, we're seeing this thing that we have not yet seen before in the ancient world, and that is these more naturalistic, uh, relaxed poses. So this Relax, kind of like alternating weight on the legs um, and alternating stress in the arms. Um, this fluid stance is referred to as contrapposto. We're going to be seeing this word over and over again, so I suggest that you memorize it and get used to it. Um, so these poses are becoming a lot more naturalistic and dynamic, especially in comparison to these Koro statues that we're seeing earlier in history. Um, men continue to be, to be depicted naked in most sculptures, um, but we're seeing a little bit of a difference in terms of how women are depicted. We're seeing um, this transition of women being very fully clothed like the peplos core, where there's not much of a suggestion of the figure underneath, to this curious phenomenon called wet drapery. So the figures are not technically naked, so it's seen as more socially acceptable to have statues of women, because like they, you can see pretty much everything. Like There's not much left to the imagination, um, but they're still technically clothed, so it's socially acceptable. So we're also seeing statues become more dynamic in terms of their use of negative space. You'll notice the use of negative space here, like you could barely see it between the arms and between the legs. Whereas in this sculpture right here of a Dory Foros, you can see more negative space between the legs and the arms. And then we occasionally get to this level of dynamism that we're seeing in the discus thrower, where we're having a massive amount of negative space here, here, and here. So during the early and high classical period, um, we're seeing these very godlike, canonized, idealized humans. Typically, they're seven heads tall. Um, there's no way for people to actually look like this in the ancient world, but rather they are ideals that people are intended to strive towards. Um, these People, like even if you're seeing individuals that are supposed to be in their 50s and 60s, which was extremely old in the ancient world, they still have these very heroic bodies, which is always fun to see like an old man face on a bodybuilder body. During the late classical period, we start to see this um, this human element injected back into sculptures. Even heroic figures have an element of exhaustion to them. Um, they're not always these super heroic, like separated from mortal concern sculptures. This statue right here of Hercules, like he is, he's exhausted. He's leaning on his club and his, his lion cloak. He's tired. He wants to take a nap, right? So it's at this point too that we're starting to see the eight heads canon um, where the figures are longer and lankier and they assume more of an S-shaped curve to the figures. <laughs> 
In terms of architecture, we see the introduction of the Ionic and Corinthian orders. So Ionic, the Ionic order is quite recognizable. Um, the column capitals have these double volutes at the end, this kind of swirly. Um, and then Corinthian columns have these smaller volutes as well as leaves. So you can see that over time we're becoming a little bit more complex. Uh, additionally, Ionic and Corinthian orders have bases on their columns. So temples and public complexes are continuing to dominate architecture into the classical period, and we're seeing mathematical formulas used to determine ideal building proportions and structures. So we mostly see rectangular buildings, um, though a couple of rounder ones also exist. In terms of painting, most of what survives from ancient Greece and ancient Greek painting manifests as pottery. Um, so murals, we have evidence that murals were very popular in ancient Greece, but again, a lot of them were lost due to their perishable nature. A lot of them were painted on wood or other surfaces that easily wore away over time. Um, we also have lots of surviving examples of mosaics, which are images made from these small, differently colored stones cemented into a surface. So um, in terms of pottery, there's several different styles of pottery that exist in ancient Greece. Um, there's white ground pottery, which is relatively rare. Um, typically, there is a white slip that is used um, to cover the, the vessel, and then we see more naturalistic color that is being used to render the figures. Um, red figure pottery typically has a black background, and then lines are drawn in to show the contours of the figures. Later, we have the development of black figure pottery, where the figures are painted black and then a stylus, basically a pointy stick or piece of metal, is used to etch out the lines of the figures. So our, our one kind of Greek vessel from the curriculum is the Niobides Crater. Um, this was actually found in Italy and not Greece, suggesting that the Greeks had pretty extensive trade networks and that these kinds of objects were, were sought out as commodities from ancient Greece um, by other lands and civilizations. So this particular piece uses the red figure technique again, black background, red figures. Um, so this um, item is quite large. It is a crater, which is a... Uh, a type of vessel that is used to mix water and wine. Typically, the ancient Greeks understood that if you just had water from a stream, um, you could get sick from it. So oftentimes, they would mix water and wine to sterilize the water and make it safe for drinking. Um, this vase has two sides. One is this kind of ambiguous narrative. We're not entirely sure what is happening. We're pretty sure that this figure is Hercules right here because he has this lion cloak and a club and he's ripped. Um, and we're, we're seeing these, these other warriors that are surrounding him. So it could be a call to arms. On the other side, um, the narrative is a little bit more clear. Um, it depicts this narrative of the cautionary tale of Niobe. So Niobe um, basically was this, this mortal woman that bragged that she had more children than the god Leto. So Leto was like, mm, yeah, but my kids are better. So Leto sent her children, Apollo and Artemis, to kill all of Niobe's 12 children. So this is a depiction of a narrative that is punishing hubris or unchecked arrogance or pride. So hubris is a pretty common motif in ancient Greek narratives. So this is one of the first times that we're seeing um, figures deviating from this tradition of isocephalism in figure painting. Typically when you see images of, of humans in these kinds of narratives, they're all on the same ground line and their heads are all at relatively the same level. What we're seeing here is this exploration of three-dimensional space. We have some figures in the front and then we're seeing the ground line kind of go back and we're seeing this, this kind of ground line implied for the figures back here. So this is, it, it probably doesn't seem significant, but in comparison to other ancient artwork that we've seen where we have figures that are all on the same ground line, this is quite significant. Here is our Doryphoros or spear bearer. So the ancient Romans loved this statue. Um, 
there was a copy of the statue that was made in bronze that was brought into ancient Rome and the Romans loved it so much that um, they had several hundred, if not several thousand copies of it commissioned in marble. So there's actually several versions of this statue that have been found. This particular statue was actually found in Pompeii in a gymnasium um, and it was intended to serve as this ideal for athletes to aspire to. So the ancient Romans really loved ancient Greek art and they um, imported lots of elements of ancient Greek culture into their own, including their pantheon of gods and goddesses. So this is the most complete copy that remains. So um, we have this very closed and firm stance and this very obvious contrapposto, this alternating weight on the legs and alternating stress in the arms. Um, interestingly, we are seeing the artist use these little blocks of marble to connect these more free-floating elements of the sculpture. This was intentional um, and oftentimes used to reduce the risk of breakage. So that's probably the reason that the sculpture is in such good condition is that there were these little safeguards in place to make sure that it stayed whole. So the Doryphoros embodies Polycletus's highly idealized human body, including this canonized seven heads proportion. So I've included the seven heads here to show you like he is exactly seven heads tall. So he once carried a spare um, and probably a shield as well on his right arm. The um, spear was probably made of metal, which is, again, why it has since been lost. So this work is really showing a marked transition between the archaic styles, which use these more rigid frontal poses and less anatomical modeling, to these um, classical styles that we, um, in the modern era, associate pretty strongly with ancient Greece.